Let's welcome Alexia, a software engineer at Intel and maintainer of Lib Fabric. She, a software engineer in the Lib Fabric team at Annapurna Labs at AWS, and Amir, an HPC systems engineer at Oak Ridge National Laboratory to discuss OFI sh integrated shared memory offload. Thanks, Phil. Let me present here. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes, yes, indeed. All righty. Well, thanks, Phil. Um, my name is Alexia. I'm working at Intel as one of the Lib Fabric maintainers. Um, so, in this presentation, we wanted to just provide an update on the peer provider model, which we presented at uh, the conference last year. And um, we wanted to provide an update since Amazon is now using and plugging into that model, and now Oak Ridge as well is uh, plugging into that. So, um, uh, we just wanted to provide an update on any changes that have happened and what issues that they've encountered. Um, so the original motivation for the peer provider was to allow providers and applications to leverage our OFI shared memory protocol uh, without having to tightly couple two providers protocols. Some of the difficulties of using two providers at once basically center around the sharing of resources, specifically the receive context and the CQ so that the peer provider um, the peer provider architecture was developed in order to provide a way for providers to share resources. Over the last year, the shared memory provider, which is a standalone provider for internet communication, has plugged into the model and now can be used with other providers. So, as I mentioned, Amazon's EFA provider was previously using the shared memory provider internally to offload some shared memory communication, but that offload was deeply connected to its protocols and expensive for EFA to manage. So they have actually moved to using Shmem as a peer. Um, Oak Ridge National Labs has also been doing work on developing um, on the peer provider, developing a new provider called the Link Provider, which allows um, providers to be linked together using an abstracted Link Provider, which just simply redirects traffic to one or another provider. So the aim of this presentation is to provide both an overview and an update on the status of the peer provider architecture, as well as an update on those two use cases. So in this presentation, we will answer the following questions. What is the peer provider and how does it work? What has changed since last year? How did AWS use it in its EFA provider? What issues did they have and how do they solve them? Um, and how did they use Shmem as a peer? How did that help EFA? Uh, what is the link provider? What does a provider need in order to leverage link support? And what is the current status and direction of the link provider? And what are future extensions that we're looking at for the peer provider architecture? Um, so like I said, the goal of the peer provider is to allow providers to offload to the OFI shared memory provider for applications or providers that do not have shared memory implementation or don't have one that can be used with another OFI provider. So OFI exposes um, one endpoint to the application while using two providers underneath. So one for internode communication and one for intranode communication. Um, in order to use these two providers at once, these providers need to share some resources. Specifically, they need to be able to write to the same CQ, update the same counters, get receive buffers from the same uh, shared receive context, which we'll abbreviate with SRX from here on out, and sh share the same addressing information. In other words, the applications FI adder that they are using for a certain peer. All of the sharing and coordination of these resources happens totally internally within the providers themselves, so no applications are necessary, which is key here. When sharing these resources, there will always be one owner of those resources and one or more peers. So the owner is the one that owns the resource and defines how to interact with that resource. So they're the ones that export that resource into the peer. The peer, on the other hand, cannot directly access the owner's resource. It has to go through the imported owner function pointers in order to interact with the resource. So this is at the core of the whole peer provider architecture. It's basically just defining a set of functions that allows a peer provider to interact with the owner, and in some cases, vice, vice versa. The owner provide, provider has to interact with the peer. So there are two main examples of how we envision providers can leverage the shared memory offload through the peer provider architecture. The first one on the left is what AWS's EFA provider is doing today. So EFA acts as an owner and creates a shared memory endpoint to use as a peer. And EFA owns all those resources here, the CQ, the counters, the shared receive context, and then imports those resources into the shared memory endpoint. 
EFA directs all that local traffic through to the shared memory provider, and Shmem just access, accesses those uh, EFA resources through those imported functions. The second example on the right is what Amir at Oak Ridge is developing. So in this method, we have a new provider, the link provider, that acts as an owner for all those resources, and it is responsible for opening the resources for both peer providers. So in this case, CXI and Shmem are used both as peers. Um, and then it imports all the shared resources into the peer provider space. The link provider picks the provider based on the target address and passes the call into the appropriate provider, which will then access the shared resources through the imported calls. And here's a closer look at each method. So in the EFA example, we see that the shared completion queues and counters and the shared receive contacts all live in the EFA provider, but Shmem is still able to access them because they were imported by EFA. And you can see in the importance of the sharing of addressing data here as well. According to the application, the local addresses here are four, five, six, and seven. But when EFA inserts the addresses into Shmem, Shmem then assigns the peers the addresses 0, 1, 2, and 3. So here we need EFA basically a way to tell Shmem what the address is expecting and what to report back to the application when it writes a completion or when it needs to match to a receive buffer with that addressing information. So that's pretty key here. And this is done through the new FIAV user ID flag when inserting an address into the Shmem AV, which does that um, translation. Um, and here's the link example. So similarly, link owns all the resources, but CXI and Shmem can both access those resources because they were imported. We have the same issue when it comes to the addressing. So link has to use the same FIAV user ID flag when adding the addresses into the peer. In this method, link doesn't actually do any transfers. It's rather just the owner of the resources and is, resp is responsible for passing those communication calls through to the correct provider, as well as polling the peer provider CQs in order to drive progress. Um, so as I mentioned before, the peer provider architecture is basically just a definition of the function calls um, to define for sharing these resources uh, between providers and how to import them. So I'll go over, up, over what these API calls are. So the first is the shared completion queue. The peer providers need a way to report completions directly to the application in order to avoid any overhead for another provider, having to pull that CQ and then rewrite the exact same entry into the application CQ. So the first step here is for the owner just to allocate a peer CQ and define the peer CQ write ops. So these are the ops that just tell the peer how to write a successful entry and an error entry into the CQ. The owner then calls FICQ open with the peer and passes in the peer CQ through the context parameter while specifying the FI peer flag. So this flag tells the peer that it should not actually allocate its own resources, but rather should use the specified write and write error calls that are being imported in that context. The second API is the shared counter API. So just like the CQ, the peer provider needs a way to in increment the correct counter when an operation completes. Now, the setup is pretty much the same. So the first thing is the owner allocates the peer counter, defines the write ops. Uh, then the owner calls FI counter open and passes the peer counter through the context parameter, sets that same FI peer flag in the attributes, so, which tells the peer provider not to allocate its own counter and just to use the imported ops that, were, that the owner is passing in. The last API is definitely the most complicated one, so stick with me here. The reason it's more complicated is that the, while the other ones only have to define the owner ops, the shared receive context actually requires both the owner ops as well as peer ops. And this is because both the owner and peer actually need to interact with each other in this resource, which is mostly due to the reality of unexpected messages, which is when a message arrives without an existing posted receive. So this requires that the owner have a way to trigger the peer to start processing a message when the receive is actually posted. So similar to the other resources, the flow starts the same. The owner creates the peer SRX context, sets its owner ops. So these are the ones that the peer is going to call to access the owner resources. The second step is also the same. The owner exports its share receive context into the peer by calling FISRX context and passing in the peer SRX through the context parameter, setting the same FI peer flag, which tells the peer not to create its own, but to use the context as a peer SRX. So during this import, we actually diverge here because the peer has to now set the peer ops to call during the unexpected path. <laughs> 
The owner ops are the ops that are defined by the owner that define what the peer should call in order to interact with the shared receive contact. So this includes how to get a posted message or a tagged received entry when a new message comes in, how to queue an unexpected entry into the owner, and then also how to free an entry when the peer is done with it. The peer ops are the ops defined by the peer and tell the owner how to deal with these unexpected messages. So this includes how to begin processing an unexpected message, as well as what to do if the application needs to discard a message um, that is waiting for a receive buffer. And since last year, you might notice this extra new call, we had to add a new owner op to the API um, called for each unspec adder, which we had to add in order to deal with this unforeseen really picky edge case dealing with unexpected messages from peers whose addresses have not been inserted into the AV yet. So while this is a pretty small case, we needed a way for the peer to let the owner know that an update has happened to its AV um, and that the owner actually needs to iterate over unexpected messages that have an unspecified address in order to update that addressing information and move it to the correct queue in order to correctly match later. Um, so our first case that we're going to go over here is Amazon's EFA provider moving from Shmem tightly embedded with the EFA protocols to now separated out using the peer provider architecture. I'll be presenting in she's place um, because she wasn't able to present today. This diagram shows an overview of EFA before integrating with the peer provider model. So EFA was still using the shared memory provider to offload intranode communication, but it was really embedded into EFA protocols, which introduced a lot of overhead. So when the application would call send, EFA would do its own protocol selection, which included both selecting whether to use Shmem or not, but also how to use Shmem. So for smaller messages, um, it would go through sh the Shmem bounce buffer and it would pass the send call directly to Shmem. But for larger messages, EFA would actually fall back to an EFA managed rendezvous protocol, sending a small packet and then initiating a Shmem read from the re remote side. So for smaller messages, EFA would still interrupt the flow by adding an EFA header to the message before sending it through Shmem. Once the message is in the shared memory provider, Shmem does its own protocol selection to figure out what to do with it um, and copies that message into its own Shmem bounce buffer. The Shmem provider would then copy the EFA sent buffer into a pre-posted receive buffer owned by EFA and write a completion into its internal CQ. EFA would pull the Shmem CQ, match the message to an application buffer, and then do an additional mem copy into the final application buffer. The EFA um, would then have to actually write an additional CQ entry with the correct information, as well as increment the appropriate counter. So you can see how going through EFA actually introduces a significant amount of overhead by having to layer on top of Shmem. Um, there's additional memory that EFA has to manage with the receive buffer posting. There's an extra mem copy in there. Um, there's an additional CQ read and write happening too. There's uh, also the overhead of having to manage that large message mem rendezvous on top of all that. Um, and with all this, AWS actually noticed 500 to 600 nanoseconds of overhead that it costs having to move resources between EFA and Shmem. So in the context of Shmem, that's a really significant amount of time and we need to cut back on that. Here's what EFA looks like today when using the Shmem through the peer provider model. So now when the application initiates a send, all EFA has to do is decide whether the target is local or remote. It doesn't have to do any other protocol selection or add an EFA header, it just sends the message as is, except for the FI adder and MR descriptors, which might be different for Shmem, uh, but it just passes the me message directly to the peer. The Shmem does the same protocol, protocol selection as before, copies it through to the bounce buffer, but this time there's no need for that EFA pre-posted Shmem bounce buffer to act as an intermediary since Shmem has direct access to the EFA own shared receive context and it can essentially request an application buffer directly from EFA through those owner ops. And similarly, there's no need for EFA to actually interrupt, intercept the CQ entry and rewrite the same entry since Shmem now has the ability to directly write to the application CQ and update the application counters. It even has the correct FI adder to report 
um, source addressing to the application since EFA added the peer using that FIAV user ID flag and told Shmem what the application FA adder is. EFA still has to pull the Shmem CQ uh, in order to drive progress through Shmem, but there's there are no completions being read or processed from it, so we eliminate that overhead. In this new model, we've eliminated now a mem copy, extra receive buffer posting and management in the entire EFA large message protocol for Shmem, as well as those duplicate CQ entries being written for Shmem and then the application as well. So moving to the new model, EFA was able to drop that overhead from those 500 to 600 nanoseconds to now only 10. Um, here's some quick graphs just to illustrate what these changes mean for application performance. These sets of data were all taken using OpenMPI 4.1.5 using two different versions of LibFabric, 1.18.1, which is before the peer model, and 1.19.0, which is after. Um, the left and the right are just showing two different instance types uh, for completion. So this first graph is showing a simple two-sided OSU latency point-to-point -point test. This is a normalized latency, so the blue is before, and you can see that the latency was cut by over half in most cases. The second graph is showing data for a 96 rank run of OSU alt to alt w which is measuring latency for collective communication. So you can see the impact remains here as we scale up. The latency drops now to about 20 to 40 percent. This last example is using a real-world application, OpenFOAM, which is a computational fluid dynamic simulation. Um, this graph is showing normalized runs per day, so higher is actually better here, as more runs means it ran faster. And so the peer provider had about a 15% performance improvement on these real-world applications. So while there were mostly good news from the switch, it also brought up a few issues and struggles, which are important to bring up as well. Um, the first one is that there is a discrepancy in the provider's ability to handle unexpected messages. The EFA provider can handle an unlimited number of unexpected messages, while the Shmem provider's CMA protocol for large messages can only handle up to Rx size number of messages, which is uh, 1K by default. Um, before using the peer provider, EFA handled the unexpected messages for Shmem through that rendezvous protocol. Uh, so it initiated that read through Shrem only when the buffer was actually posted, so that eliminated this issue. Once the switch happened, all unexpected messaging was basically handed off to Shmem and exposed this restriction that we didn't know about and introduced a regression that's still being worked on today. The second issue surrounds locking models for threaded applications. We need a dedicated lock to protect the shared receive context resources, uh, which we need to hold while calling progress into Shmem in case it calls those owner ops. Currently, the lock is created as a domain level lock, which can cause locking contention when the domain is shared by multiple endpoints. Um, and there's ongoing discussions uh, for LibFabric 2.0 that Jinxing talked about that are centered around proper locking models throughout LibFabric, um, since this is a pretty universal problem. The last problem is that there is some overhead due to different memory region descriptors. Descriptors are interpreted by providers differently. Shmem uses this OFI MR struct, while EFA uses its own EFA MR struct, which means that memory needs to be registered twice, once for each provider, and translation is also required when passing descriptors between providers. Um, so overall, we need a better way to share these descriptors between the providers in order to eliminate that duplicate memory registration and also that lookup and translation, translation as well. Um, so next up, Amir uh, will talk about the second peer provider method of using an abstracted link provider to link two providers together. So take it away, or take it away, Amir. Hello, can you guys hear me? I think I can. Yes, okay. we can. Great. So let me share my screen. All right, you guys see the screen? Yes. Not good. All right, so yeah, my name is Amir Shahat. I, I work at the Advanced Technology Section in Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, today, I'll just go over a follow-up update on the LinkX provider. Uh, this is a new provider we started developing last year. So the motivation for developing LinkX was to provide an alternative MPI software stack based on OpenMPI on an OLCF's Frontier supercomputer. Our users typically 
uh, like having access to alternative software stacks to work around problems or to simply debug their applications. However, the vendor only provides a proprietary Cray and Pitch implementation, which relies on a new Lib Fabric provider called CXI to support the new slingshot interconnect. This provider doesn't support uh, shared memory offload since shared memory is implemented in Cray and Pitch. So the solution we went with is to create a new link provider uh, that can link any two the fabric providers or the design is to link any two the fabric providers uh, in our solution we link both the uh, CXI and Shmem lib fabric provider and this is currently deployed on frontier and can be used with open MPI so the as I mentioned the CXI provider provider has no shared uh, memory offload so when we were initially looking at the potential solutions to fill this gap there were too many uh, two primary paths that we could have taken one is using the message uh, transfer layer in open mpi in this layer <clears throat> only one lib fabric provider is selected and used for all, <coughs> sorry <coughs> for all communication the other option was to use the btl path and use open mpi shared memory module, module btl allows uh, the selection of the shared memory module internal to open mpi <coughs> sorry <coughs> versus the lib fabric provider if we need to i don't know what's going on here <coughs> so why did we choose to develop a new lib fabric provider basically we wanted a flexible solution which can uh, link any set of providers together. Using the BTL path would have restricted the solution only to the open MPI uh, application. By pushing the linking of providers down to LibFabric, we create a solution which any application or middleware using LibFabric can benefit from. Another benefit uh, of having a linking provider avoid, avoids us having to re-implement shared memory in multiple places and it avoids us having providers implement their own shared memory or, or put in the work to use the discussed um, uh, peer infrastructure to uh, use shared the shared memory provider. So have everything in one place kind of thing. Uh, and as I mentioned, the solution can also be expanded to link any set of provider, which can allow us to uh, support, say, heterogeneous interfaces or implement other features like multi-rail. Multi so um, I presented the detailed architecture last year. Uh, the link of the presentation is shown on the screen. Briefly though, we introduced the LinkX provider, which can be selected by an application. In this example, it's the open MPI uh, MTL layer. It binds the CXI and shared memory together uh, using the peer infrastructure we just talked about. LinkX shares its own shared receive and completion queues with peer or core provider, which do the actual communication work. Uh, and the selection criteria is fairly simple. Uh, the LinkX provider, uh, in the LinkX provider, if the destination is an unknown process, we use shared memory provider. Otherwise, we use the CXI provider. Uh, in essence, LinkX behaves as both an application and a provider. Users of LibFabric see LinkX as a provider they can select, but LinkX itself behaves as an application of sorts, which uses other, provider, other providers. Um, it sets up the LibFabric infrastructure, domains, endpoints, etc., as an application would. A key difference is that we can uh, do that for any number of providers, not just one. And as I already mentioned, this process is streamlined by using the newly created peer infrastructure. Um, during operation, the core provider uh, pulls the receive request of the LinkX shared queue and posts the completion events on the shared completion queue. Uh, Alexia talked about this before, so no need to go into details here. Um, the LinkX uh, status, um, so an open MPI version which uses LinkX is available on Frontier right now. It has been tested and continues to be tested at scale as we speak. We've tested linking the shared memory provider with CXI and RxM. This means we can use shared memory provider alongside Slingshot or uh, TCP uh, uh, or verbs. Uh, it currently supports tagged and RMA interfaces only uh, and has no counter support at this time. So how can you use it uh, if you have access to Frontier? Uh, you can load the UMS and the UMS 024 modules. This will load the, the deployed OpenMPI and LibFabric uh, software stack, which has the LinkX provider. Uh, 
in the latest implementation of LinkX, we can export a new environment variable to specify which two providers to link. Currently, we're restricted to linking only two provider, and the first of which has to be Shmim uh, provider. Once you set the environment variable, the fi info command will list all possible links, uh, like you see on the screen here. Uh, the application can then select the link it wants to use in OpenMPI, for example, you can use an MCA parameter, the OPA common OFI provider include to uh, explicit to be explicit about that. Uh, now I want to quickly highlight some performance numbers. Uh, so I ran OSU all to all or reduce and all gather with 56 processes on a single frontier node. The orange line is uh, OpenMPI using Shmem directly, and the blue line is OpenMPI using LinkX, which then uses Shmem as the core provider. As you can see, the two lines practically overlap. The intent here is to highlight that LinkX has negligible, negligible performance overhead at this scale. Uh, this is the all gather. You can again, you can see that pretty much overlap. Um, I performed the same set of tests with the CXI provider and LinkX. Uh, when using LinkX, I disabled Shmem, which means all communication is going over CXI provider. This is an apples to apples comparison. I ran the tests with 1,024 processes spanning 128 nodes with eight processes per node. We do see some overhead when using LinkX as this at, the, at this collective uh, size, as you can see in the second graph is kind of, uh, more obvious. So there's a couple of open questions that we need to address. When we do memory registrations, there's no real good way for LinkX to know which core provider it should register the memory with. Right now, we just register against all the providers we're linking, but this is not an optimal solution. So we need to investigate the best way to do, to do this. The second issue is the hardware uh, offload support. Because we need to support receiving from any source, we can't offload receive operations to the hardware or else we'll end up with possible data corruption. If we can turn off receive from any feature, then we can use hardware offload, offload like tag matching. Right now we have to turn it off. So we need to sort of investigate the best way to, to, to handle hardware offload in, in the peer infrastructure in general. So some future work items, there are still a few items that we need to support. We need to support the full gamut of the Fabric APIs. We need to continue optimizing uh, the LinkX to reduce uh, any overhead introduced. Uh, memory registration, like I just said, we need, it needs to be streamlined. Uh, hardware offload needs to be handled better. There's, this is something we we'll potentially need to address at the peer infrastructure layer. Uh, finally, we need to expand LinkX to support any set of providers, which would naturally allow us to support heterogeneous setups, as well as aggregate the bandwidth of multiple homogeneous, uh, homogeneous interfaces. So in conclusion, to quickly wrap up, the OpenMPI version which uses LinkX is available on Frontier. LinkX provides a portable solution for doing shared memory offload, which can benefit any Lift Fabric user. Uh, I discussed the potential features which can be implemented through LinkX, like multi-rail and heterogeneous interface support. Uh, we need to make sure we squeeze as much performance from LinkX as possible. And finally, I'm currently working on upstreaming um, the LinkX provider. It should be going upstream soonish. Uh, any questions? All right, if there are any questions, please either unmute yourself or ask questions in chat and I can uh, recite them to the speakers. Okay, if there are no other questions, then uh, thank you very much, Alexia, the mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.